So Trump and Cruz, they held a rally here in downtown Houston around two weeks ago, and I actually went. It wasn't planned, but a friend got me a free ticket. I really wanted to experience it for myself. And here's a little bit about what I think. One of the first things I noticed, right, we had about 16,000 or more people sitting in this huge audience, a huge auditorium. It was the Toyota Center where the Rockets play, right, NBA basketball games. And outside, maybe 1,000 or 2,000 or more. And I'm sure hundreds of thousands of people around the world, if not millions, were watching. And one of the first things I noticed is that the whole show or the whole um, series of speeches began with a prayer, right? I assume it was an evangelical priest or preacher or a religious figure. I don't know the person. But uh, he, he made a prayer which I think wasn't orthodox, wasn't typical in the sense that he went through all the political positions. He went through basically the entire platform and specifically talked about the candidates and why he supported them and insinuated that God was basically on their side. And there's a few things I want to say about this. First of all, all right, I'm not Christian. I'm not against the fact that faith was brought up. Not at all, on the contrary. I'm not against what happened or are or, or, uh, cynical because I'm not Christian. Not at all. But there is something that I thought was interesting. I've heard this from other Christians as well, and I've heard this from Christian leaders. I don't think if Jesus was here in the 21st century that he'd be very proud of our nation. I don't think he'd be very proud of the U.S. and what we stand for today and how we treat other people specifically. And I'll give you a few examples and you're free to disagree. We have a homelessness problem in the U.S. That's one thing. One thing I've seen with my own eyes. I've seen it in Houston. I've heard about it in Dallas. And of course, we've all heard about Flint, Michigan and other areas in Chicago and other cities that are crime infested, that have uh, their kids that go to school, go to public schools in order to get their one meal a day because, you know, there's a free breakfast, lunch, whatever it is at the cafeteria. This is the United States. We're not talking about Africa. We're not talking about Asia. We're not talking about Latin America. We're talking about in the U.S., supposedly the, the richest country in the world, the most powerful country in the world. Not supposedly. I mean, it is. That's the reality. But there's a homelessness problem. There's a, there's, there's, there's a poverty problem. There's a violence problem. I'll talk about that later. Guns and the Second Amendment. But we definitely have our issues. But it was insinuated that if Jesus was to be here today and if God, looked, God looks down on us, which I believe he does, that he'd be smiling, he'd be completely happy, that if Jesus was to come down, that he'd be, you know, he would have the, the, American, <laughs> the American flag around his shoulders and that he would salute the flag. I strongly disagree with all that. And I really think that isn't the case. Um, I would encourage you to watch uh, lectures by Chris Hedges and others who, it turns out that he's actually, uh, he actually studied divinity. He studied theology for like three years at Harvard. And anyway, he... He considers, he, considers, he considers this ideology, this thinking about American exceptionalism and American Christianity as heretical and against you know, Jesus' teachings. And as a non-Christian, I, I can see that and I strongly agree. And that was one thing. The second thing I noticed, so, so the, 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 uh, the prayer is finished, right? We said, Amen. We begin. And throughout all the speeches, and we had the governor speak, senators speak. We had obviously Trump, the president of the United States, came down and spoke supporting Ted Cruz, encouraging us to vote for him, all the speeches, and generally they were okay. Um, they were exciting, it was exhilarating, it was nice to be there. But I noticed that if you look at the audience, it was like a sporting match. I was reminded of the Colosseum, the Romans, and the, all the yays and boos and nays and all the uh, all these short, short sentences with just a few words and just very big, what do call them, slogans. And a lot of cheering, a lot of audience. It was, it was kind of immature, but it also was like, they're ordinary people. I mean, I looked to my right and left, they treated me well, they were nice people, ordinary Americans. But the speeches were like a middle school level. And all the issues were broken down in such simple terms. And again, it was all this cheering and so on. I don't know, I don't know what to say, but obviously there's lots of process. Um, one of the conclusions I did come to, I feel pretty strongly about sharing this, it's my feeling. What Trump does and why he's very magnetic and very exciting and very charismatic to many people is that he took the complicated world that we live in and all the issues and all the struggles and all the all the issues, all the policies, and he broke them down and basically created a story. He created this narrative. It's very easy to understand. He's basically the hero. And there are all these enemies and he comes and destroys them all one by one. Right? He's a hero that saves us from everything. The media, there are enemies. The Democrats, there are enemies. It's like red and blue. It's a sporting match, but he's the hero. He's the captain of the team and he comes and defeats all the enemies and defeats all our rivals and, and he wins. And for those who haven't felt a win in many years, it's easier to see why they would follow him and see him as this brave, courageous leader. So I get it. But I really want to warn people away from staying away from such oversimplifications and the life is a little bit more, life is a little bit more compli complicated than that. An extreme reaction to, uh, to confusion or lack of education about all of these issues is to just take the cult-like mentality of it's me versus everybody else or it's us versus everyone, it's me versus them. And it might make you feel good, especially if you're winning, especially if your champion was elected president, but what happens when he gets impeached or when he loses the next election or when the Democrats are in power, what, what's going to happen then? Right? It reminds me a lot of the ISIS mentality. And yeah, those are two different worlds, but there's actually, there are parallels to be made. Uh, ISIS has a similar narrative where it's us versus the world and we're right and everybody's wrong and we're here to revive whatever quote unquote Islamic leadership, politics, state, caliphate, whatever you want to call it. 
And Trump has a way of seeing that the founding fathers were here. There's all this garbage in the middle and then it's us, right? Maybe a few good people in the middle, but generally no one did it as good as we do. We're the greatest, we're the best. Better than ever before. Things are great and things are fantastic. We're the greatest presidents have ever lived. The greatest policies, the greatest executive orders. We're the greatest people in power. It's like, are you kidding me? He literally, in this speech, in this, <laughs> I heard this at the Trump rally with my own two ears. He compared himself to George Washington, saying George Washington elected all the judges of the Supreme Court and he elected two and he's hoping to elect a third or whatever it was, saying he's basically putting himself a second best after George Washington, the founding fathers, then us. It's actually very similar to the ISIS mentality. For those who listen and understand the, the words and terminology that Muslims use, he talked about the, the original leaders after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the companions, right? The originals, the, the, the first, the best, our role models. And he basically said that ISIS basically feels that we're right after them, that they're not we, but they are right after them. So I warn you from the cult-like mentality. That was another point. Uh, what else? I have a few experiences with Beto and Cruz that I think are worth mentioning considering that the elections are in a few days. Um, this was about a year and a half ago, me and a group of, um, of young Muslim leaders from Texas and really from all over the country went to DC to lobby Congress. It was May, it was um, Muslim National Advocacy Day at the Capitol. We went and they do this every year and we went to speak to, speak to our representatives, we went to speak to our Congress people and obviously we talked about things like civil rights and Islamophobia and Muslims in America and issues close to our hearts. And everybody meets with us, Democrats, Republicans. If you're there from California, you're there to meet with your Californian representatives. If you're there from Texas, obviously we're there to meet Cruz and others. And Cruz refused to meet with us. So considering that he's a politician, he's a diplomat, like his job is literally to meet with his constituents. I mean, we vote for these people, right? They're supposed to serve us. That's the idea, right? You're our president, our representative, our leader, our congressperson. You're there to serve us. But anyway, he refused to meet with us. We met with others, very right-wing people. We met with people like Joe Barton, who basically disagreed with almost everything I had to say, and we discussed it. And it was interesting, and maybe I'll talk about that at another time. But he refused to meet with us, which is obviously completely unacceptable. I had the complete opposite experience with Beto. We met him, Beto Oruk, we met with him in DC as well. It was about a year and a half ago. And he was announcing that he's running against Ted Cruz. Very nice, friendly guy. He was charismatic. We heard him speak. We were happy to know that he was coming and reaching out to all the different groups. He's here to represent everybody. And obviously speeches are easy, words are easy, anybody can talk. But I met him in person again just a few months ago here, was here in Houston. And it was a long line of people. And after giving an hour or two hour speech, again, very exciting, very charismatic. He spoke at like 254 counties, out of 254 counties in Texas. He literally went everywhere. And you can follow him on social media. He's at like every city in Houston, multiple times a day. Anyway, get the point. He's, he's, I don't know how he does it. But once you meet with him in person, he speaks to you like he's a peer. I literally spoke to him about all sorts of issues and he's speaking to me like we're on the same page, we're on the same age. And so he's, his aspirations are very high, yet he's very humble. He's very down to earth. And I respect that. I think that's awesome. And if you haven't seen my video already, I would encourage you to watch it of why I'm voting for Beto. Again, I encourage you to go vote for Beto. At least go vote. It's in a few days and voting is one of the most powerful things you can do as a citizen of the United States. People around the world wish they had this power, this right, this privilege, and many countries do not. In some countries you vote and you don't even know if it counts. In other countries you vote and you know that it, is, it doesn't count. And other places you can't even vote. So what we have is something special. I would say it's your responsibility and obligation as an American citizen, and it's your responsibility and obligation as a Muslim to go vote, to do your part, to have your say, especially when it seems black and white. Be Beto versus Cruz. I mean, I'm not a Republican nor a Democrat. I'm against putting myself in either box. I, I don't think we should. I think you should be critical and engage with both sides and look at the issues. But in this case, the way Cruz holds himself out and how he speaks about other people versus Beto, I think it's clear. I'd like to end with this. There's one of the themes I've noticed in a lot of Trump's speeches, especially in the last few months with the UN meeting in New York and him commenting about the UN, about Nikki Haley, about, the, uh, about human rights, about the environment, about basically global affairs um, and international relations. And specifically in this rally that I heard in two weeks, he has this theme of nationalism, patriotism versus globalism, right? And he associates the left and, and this idea of cooperation and tolerance and globalism with being this softy, being socialist, being a communist, all sorts of negative labels, whatever he can throw at you, right? You're evil, you're the enemy, and we're patriotic and we're nationalistic and that's supposed to be the right way to go. And this is a very false dichotomy, but it's also, he's definitely on the wrong side, that's for sure, and I'll tell you why. Multiple reasons. One, this idea of globalism isn't just an ideology, it isn't a liberal secular ideology, which, in which case I'll be very critical. It's the reality of the world we live in, based on telecommunications, communication, based on transportation, the last couple of decades have been very different than people previous times. You can't deny the fact that we can talk to each other in a way we never could before. We're more connected than ever. And we can travel in ways that we couldn't. And because of these two things, out of other reasons, basically technology, the world is different. And a lot of the issues 
transcend one country and they transcend borders. I'll give you a few examples. Diseases are widespread, right? And diseases travel. Diseases don't care about walls. They don't care about borders. They don't care about continents. They don't care about the countries drawn on the map. Diseases are something countries have to work for, work toward solving and eradicating. Poverty. Again, it could be multi. There could be multiple factors that cause poverty and homelessness and so on. And they don't. And, and these issues don't really matter. Your skin color. It doesn't matter. Your nationality. It doesn't matter. Your citizenship. Your passport. Those are things we agreed on, and they have their. They have their place. But there are things that transcend. How about dictators and oppressive regimes? And how about non-state actors and terrorists? And, um, and crime, how do you solve these things without the United Nations and other and na nations basically working together and non-government organizations across the world working together? Anyway, it's globalism and cooperation and, and international relations are just realities of the world we live in. You have to deal with it. You have to, you have to be diplomatic and you have to work with other countries. You have to agree to disagree on certain things. You have to agree to work on certain things. Speaking about them like they're, these ideologies are here to just you know, take over our country and ruin our lives and that they're not Christian, they're not American, blah, blah, blah. They're against the founding father, they're against the constitution is false and it's dangerous. And that's why Trump's rhetoric isn't just rhetoric. And an, an example of this, an example when his ideas are actually impacting people on the, on the ground, as you can see today, is in immigration. And it's, a, and it's a cause that I'm very passionate about and I could probably make another video about. But we see that there's a, this quote unquote caravan, this army that's approaching the US. See, even, even just, just the language he uses, an army approaching the US, these people are escaping from persecution in other countries. It's not an army, they're not armed. And he's sending the, he's sending the He's sending the U.S. military to go to go face them. I don't know what's going to happen, but I pray to God that things are resolved in a peaceful manner. Again, Beto versus Cruz. It's clear. It's obvious. Vote against Trump and anybody that supports Trump and anybody that's running with Trump, like Cruz, best friends. Trump comes down to Houston to create this huge rally to tell people to vote for Cruz. You need to vote both of them out for, for many reasons. More to come in the future. Thank you very much for listening.